Now, you know that for a body to be healthy, that it takes exercise, right? Well, I found out something recently. I thought this was an appropriate analogy that uh, a couple years ago, Ohio State University did a study that showed that bodily exercise can increase, or I should say accelerate, the healing of wounds by up to 25%. And what a great sort of analogy, right? If that is true of the physical body, how much more true is it of the spiritual body? And that's why I say in this time, in trying times, in times of transition, you can't become complacent. You can't start uh, resting. But now is the time to be active. So we turn to Matthew 28 and this great commission and the words of Jesus to go. Go. But here at the end of Matthew's gospel, we find the scene of the risen Jesus. And I want to help kind of set the scene, gives context to what Jesus says to the apostles here. The risen Jesus is appearing, to Gal appearing in Galilee to the disciples. And what the disciples encounter there is such a profound and visionary experience that it says, uh, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And that, I think, gives us some insight into maybe what's going on here, because uh, at the end of the service today, you'll go home and someone might ask you, well, how was the sermon, right? And I, I don't know what you'll say after that, but I know one thing you won't say is, I'm not sure if the pastor was really there today. <laughs> uh, we may all have just had this big group hallucination, right? Uh, that won't be your response. Why? Because my appearance to you this morning is very ordinary. This fits exactly what you would expect of me if I was simply here. But something about the presence of Jesus to the disciples on this mountainside evokes both worship and doubt. So I say that for us in order to visualize the scene that the disciples are gathered there on the mountainside and Jesus appears to them not in an ordinary form but in his glorified body. The luminous, the luminous Christ appears to the disciples like something you would see in a vision or a dream and here in this majestic display of his divinity he gives these words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, Matthew is very careful to conclude his gospel with these words because it kind of bookends the story that he's telling. Jesus concludes, this, Matthew concludes his story about Jesus by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And it's a bookend because if you go back to the beginning, one of the earliest scenes of the gospel, we find the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Now we know the first two temptations, this, the devil comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, then do this. Or if you are the son of God, then do that. But in the third and final temptation, he drops all pretense and he says, the Bible says the devil took him to a very high mountain. So here again, Jesus is on a mountain, a similar sort of iconography of the scene. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him what? All the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, isn't it interesting that the devil can offer the kingdoms of the world to Jesus? And Jesus does not contest the claim, right? The claim is not contested that the kingdoms of the world do, in fact, belong to the devil. By virtue of Adam's sin and the continuing disobedience, of the nations, these kingdoms belong to Satan and he can give them to whomever he wishes. But you see, if Jesus takes the shortcut there in Matthew 4, at the beginning of the story, if Jesus takes the shortcut, right, because that is his goal. The goal of Jesus is to win the earth. The goal of Jesus is to have victory. The goal of Jesus is to receive all authority but he can't take the shortcut. The point 
the big picture of Matthew's gospel is that Jesus intends on winning the earth, but he's going to do it on his own terms. And that's what we see here after the resurrection of Jesus. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has unseated the devil. Jesus now takes his throne as the rightful king of this world. The resurrection, you see, and this is very interesting to me, the resurrection is the perfect example of what we would call revolution in the most straightforward sense. You are familiar with Jesus uh, saying that uh, the first will be last and the last will be first, right? What does that mean? But that everything gets turned upside down. The first will be last, the last will be first, to be turned upside down. That's what the word revolution means, right? To turn over. And that's exactly what we see on display in the death and resurrection of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus takes the lowest place. Jesus takes the weakest place, the poorest place, the most despised place. Jesus takes the last place, and for that very reason, he is given the first place. This is what Paul says to the Corinthians. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. The things that are not to reduce to nothing the things that are. And again, perhaps even more clearly, he says to the Philippians, Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So you see how Paul maps this descent of Jesus, this emptying of Jesus, that though he was equal with God, he became man. And not just a man, Paul says, but a slave. And not just a slave, Paul says, but a dead slave. And not just a dead slave, but a crucified slave. Paul is marking point by point the descent of Jesus to the lowest possible place. And then the very next word that Paul says is therefore. Now what does therefore mean? It means because of this. Therefore, because he has descended to the lowest place, Paul says, therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see the structure of what's going on here? The resurrection of Jesus is the victory of the weak over the strong, the victory of the poor over the rich, the victory of the foolish over the wise. And the early apostles embraced this revolutionary spirit of the resurrection by referring to Christ's resurrection in Greek as anastasis. Anastasis. It means literally to get up again. But the term is also a political term that was used in the day to refer to a rebellion or a revolution. So it is literally, this is kind of the play on words that's being used here. It is literally, the resurrection is a rising up, but it is also what we might say an uprising. And that pun, that double meaning was not lost on the early Christians who were put to death for refusing to pledge allegiance to any nation or kingdom of this world and pledge their allegiance solely to Jesus Christ. Now, why is all of this important? Because of what Jesus says next. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of this, go. So it is because of the resurrection of Jesus. It is because of the victory of Jesus over Satan that righteousness has defeated sin. Life has defeated death. Humanity has been reconciled to God. Sin and death no longer have a rightful claim over a single soul. The work has been completed. Now it is simply a matter of letting people know what has happened, the good news. I think the perfect analogy for this is 
January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. And in that very moment, legally speaking, the slaves are freed. But does that mean that at that very moment, all of the slaves are actually freed? No, why not? Because it takes time for the message, for the good news, for the word to disseminate to the people. And so, of course, it's in the interest of some to keep others ignorant of their freedom. And that's the situation that we live in, in the same way the devil is already defeated. But he can keep us under his power so long as we refuse to believe the good news of Christ's victory that has won our freedom. So finally, then, the apostles are instructed to go and do one thing. One thing they're told to go and do with two components. Okay? One thing with two components. What is it? What's the one thing Jesus tells them to go do? Make disciples of all nations. And what's that mean to create disciples? But to create imitators, emulators, spiritual apprentices, to create little Christs, Christians, to send out into the world, to create reflections of the one Master and Lord Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a reflection and an apprentice of the Master. So how do you do this one thing? How do you go and make disciples? Well, that's where Jesus gives two components. Number one, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And two, to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Now, I could preach a whole message on either one of these two things, uh, but let me summarize this very briefly. Uh, baptizing and teaching them to obey. Why? Why these two things and why this order? Well, again, what's the goal? What's the one thing we've been told to do? To make disciples, right? So how do these two things accomplish that goal? The goal is to make disciples, to make people Christ-like. And baptism has to be the first step in that process because we need the grace of God and the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us to obey. If we're going to be Christ-like, then God has to make the first move. And let's be clear about something. In baptism, it is God acting, not us. Baptism is not our work. Baptism is God's work in us. We've spent the past several weeks talking about the relation of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Those of you who have been here, you know we've, we've been talking about this recently. And so I hope by now that it's clear what this Trinitarian formula, this relation of the triune God, might have to do with baptism. As I explain to people when I'm studying with them for baptism, is that baptism is the moment of our adoption into the family of God. And no matter where you may go from here, you will never be unadopted. Right? Now, I know that there's a, there's a practice, and I'm going a little off book here, but I know there's a practice, and, and I've shared this with many of you. Uh, several of us, I'm sure, even have been baptized more than once. But whenever I study with someone for baptism, I always make it a point to make this very clear, that baptism is not about how it makes you feel. Baptism is not about you doing something to, to commend yourself to God. But God is doing something in you. God is claiming you at your baptism. And just like the prodigal son, you may go and wander off. And when you come back, you might think, I'm not worthy to be called a child. But the message of Jesus is that you are always a child. And when you come back, you are always welcomed with open arms. So we are baptized into this triune name because it is in baptism that we receive the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38.
And we thereby become united to the Son, Romans 6, 3, and are therefore able to call God our Father, Galatians 4, 6. You see that formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In baptism, we receive the Spirit so that we might be united to the Son, so that we might call God our Father. Our baptism is our adoption into the family of God. And then, having been adopted, we are taught to obey. You see, it is only by the power of the indwelling spirit, it is only by the support of the body of Christ that we are able to live our calling in obedience. That's why Paul explains, you are no longer slaves, you are children. And therefore, you no longer obey out of fear, but out of love. So having been welcomed into the family of God, we are freed to go and live as Christ did. When Jesus says, go and teach them everything I have commanded you, what is he referring to but his command to love and serve the world? So having been baptized, having been adopted into the life of God, we are then sent out to be Christ to our neighbor. And that's why Matthew's gospel concludes with the words of Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How is it that Jesus is with us, but that Jesus is in us? Jesus is among us as us. Does that make sense? We are commissioned to be Christ to the world, and in this way he says, I am with you always in this mission. As Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So that's my challenge to you today. That's my challenge to you next week. This theme of mission will not be going away anytime soon. And it begins with your response. It begins with your response to this call to go, to go and be disciples. Now, Vinny already uh, pointed this out, but if you haven't already done this, you have another opportunity. So this is your bulletin insert, these volunteer opportunities. Now, a few times I have uh, called your attention to something and asked you to write something down. You guys know what I'm talking about. But see, now it's even easier for you because you don't have to tear it off of the bulletin. It's already torn out for you. So you have a form in your hand uh, and you can write down your name and your phone number, a way for us to get a hold of you. And if some of these stand out to you as something that you'd like to do, please check that box and I will be collecting them in the back. So you don't get to shake my hand unless you're handing me one of these, okay? How about that? Uh, no, but this is, your, this is your opportunity to respond. So uh, I, I think we have to be aggressive with this kind of stuff. I'm sorry to go into sales pitch mode, but it, this is what it takes, right? Because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good idea, that's a good idea. But you have to do this. You have to respond to this. This is what it's going to take for this church to move forward. This is what it's going to take for this church to, to get over the hump. Now, you might look at these and say, oh, I don't know if I can do any of these. Well, that's why you can check the box that says other. So there's no excuse not to fill this out because there's an other box. And if you check the other box, then I'll follow up with you personally and we'll find something for you to do. Okay, how about that? I hope that sounds okay. So please fill this out. Uh, Vinny will also be in the back uh, to answer any questions you may have. Um, don't think that ignoring it today will then take it off of your uh, radar. I'm going to be doing the same thing next week. But you know what the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your hearts. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that means that the call to love and serve is not a recommendation. Amen? Oh, whoa, that was dead. See, okay, maybe I've made people uncomfortable. But the call to love and serve is not a recommendation. Amen? Oh, that was still pretty weak, but okay. It's your life's purpose. This is what Pastor Mike used to always talk about. This is the meaning of life. It's your life's purpose, your highest calling. Not everyone is called to be a preacher and a teacher. Not everyone is called to stand behind a pulpit. But we are all called to proclaim the good news of the resurrection through our love and service. I invite you to pray with me. Father God, 
Bless us with your spirit. Unite us to your son. Make us witnesses to your gospel through our lives. God, if our hearts may be hard this morning, pray that you would soften them. If we are lacking courage, I pray that you would empower us. Strengthen this congregation. Heal our wounds. Move us forward in your service, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.